Hey, thanks for having me here. And uh, I, this is, as I mentioned to you, this is a part of my doctoral project on Mumbai's ex-mill workers' responses to the closure of textile mills and the transformation of Mumbai into a service sector economy. I have mainly looked at three responses in my doctoral thesis. The first response looks at the reverse migration of Mumbai's ex-mill workers to their villages and the challenges of incorporation into the rural habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, the second response I examine is the occupational choices of Mumbai-based ex-mill workers uh, and the role of caste and religion. And the third response, uh, which is the topic of my presentation today here, is about the rehabilitation politics, specifically looking at housing and alternative employment. And as you can see in the picture, and this is from a workers' rally in Azad Maidan in Mumbai. And if you look at the banner, which is in Marathi, there are these little two circles, which I mean, Hakka Chekhar and Rozgar, which is rightful housing and employment. So this is the overview of my presentation. I'll just raise the questions that I'm addressing in the paper. A quick look at the data and methods, and then I'll give a brief overview of the transformation of Mumbai into a post-industrial city. And then I'll come to the rehabilitation question and few concluding remarks. So the questions are, how are the Indian state and the mill owners slash real estate developers responding to the ex-mill workers rehabilitation question? And the second one is, how is the political mobilization of ex-mill workers affecting the rehabilitation question? I mean, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the location of Mumbai in India, but what I would like to show is uh, the working class district. So the circle in the Mumbai map is uh, known as Giranga, which is a village of textile mills. And this is where all the 58 textile mills were located in Mumbai, uh, employing about 250,000 workers till early 80s. So this is uh, this has been the center for political activities, but the workers have not really; they are still not there. They have really uh, dispersed to the different parts of Mumbai, to the suburbs, and even to the extreme suburbs, which you cannot even probably see in the map, and also to the villages that I just mentioned. Uh, so what has happened during the 1980s uh, in the south of Mumbai, which is really at the tip of the peninsula, is that the business district really saturated in terms of the office space. And as the city was undergoing an economic transformation during the 80s, quite rapidly uh, towards a service sector economy, the, the demand for office space was growing. And therefore, there was a shift towards north. And that's where the circle, where the textile mills were located. So the demand for the space in the textile district started growing. And secondly, this was also the time when the real estate market was gaining momentum. So the mill workers, for the mill workers, it was more lucrative to sell this land in the real estate market, market than to continue the textile production. Of course, the problem of acquiring this land uh, for uh, office purposes uh, could not happen very easily also because this land was meant only for industrial purpose and it couldn't be used anything else but for industrial purposes and also it was a big problem of retrenching uh, this huge workforce which was quite political in nature so i did my field work in so i was based in this uh, area called parel for about 14 months and I traveled to different parts of Mumbai and villages while I was based there. And this is the data that I have gathered. So the, my main focus was on those ex-mill workers who lost their jobs since the late 1990s because that's the time when uh, the mill started closing down. So the first mill closed around 1997 and so that I took that as the date of start to look at the mill workers. So I did um, in-depth interviews, about 80 interviews. Uh, group discussions, non-participant observations, and uh, I have also done some interviews in the villages, which I have not mentioned here. And then I collected a survey of 1,037 uh, ex-mill workers, uh, of which uh, 113 are uh, reverse migrated ex-mill workers, and uh, the 924 are still based in the Mumbai city. Who's um, yeah, it's like nomadic tribes and the caste we couldn't locate.
Christians? Uh, could be, but very minor. Like uh, mill workers, there was not a big proportion of Christians in, in the textile mills. So I, I can speak about this in detail. I mean, if you have some questions during the question and answer session, so I just thought I'll give you a snapshot of what the data is like. So now coming to the transformation of Mumbai towards a post-industrial city. The city of Mumbai since the mid 19th century was known for its textile industry which employed, as I said, about 250,000 workers till the early 1980s. During the early 1980s, the textile workers went on an 18 month long strike after which nearly 100,000 workers were not taken back to work. The strike has a distinction of never being called off and as such, the, even today it continues. And in January last year, the strike completed three decades. Along with the textile industries, there was a large number of workforce in the other allied industries that were dependent on textile industry, such as the engineering, chemicals, and other industries that supported the textile industry. And even that have closed down. And as a result, you can see the gradual reduction of workforce has also resulted in the decline of formal sector workforce in the Mumbai city from 65% in 1961 to 35% in the 1991. And since the textile mill started closing down during the late 1990s, the percentage has even come down. On the other hand, as you can see, there are the share of service sector which comprises of banking, insurance, information technology enabled services, shopping malls and entertainment industry has been on rise. Under the pretext of establishing environmental friendly industries such as the IT and banks, uh, the state has planned to develop the manufacturing in the hinterland which is far away from the textile district, working class district. The rise of real estate prices has also pushed the working class and the poor from the working class district to the extreme suburbs. This transformation has also implications for alternative employment and housing, which I am going to discuss in a while. The retrenched workforce cannot find better paid jobs as the new economy requires different skills and knowledge. The low level work that is available for is casual in nature and the wages are low and the working conditions are abysmal. Although the state, while allowing for the closure of mills, made provisions for housing and alternative employment for mill workers on the mill lands, the policies pursued by the state do not allow the conditions for its fulfillment. The jobs in the manufacturing sector are allowed only in the hinterland and the provision for the housing is complicated as the amount of land that required is not enough for all the mill workers. And even the limited share that is available to the mill workers has not been handed over by the private mill owners to the state. Coming to the mill closures and the rehabilitation question now. As I mentioned earlier, that there was a growing demand for land from the service sector and the real estate prices were also rapid, rising rapidly during the 1980s. The mill owners saw it more profitable, therefore, to sell the land in the real estate market. However, the land could only be used for industrial purposes. This was a major hurdle for the mill workers, sorry, mill owners' plans to sell the land in the real estate market. Mill owners therefore began citing losses during the 1980s and started closing down the mills. And therefore, they asked permission to the state that in order to revive the textile mills, they need to sell portions of the land and which the profit of which can be really pumped back into the textile mills for the revival of the industry. There was a big political tussle, and, but eventually in the 1991, the state allowed the mill, uh, mill owners to sell that little proportion of land so that the profits can be pumped back into the revival of textile industry. There was a small clause while the state allowed the permission that the land on which a development could take place, it has to be shared between three partners. The first partner was the Mahada, which is Maharashtra Housing Area Development Authority, uh, which is meant for providing low cost housing. So that was one of the objectives. The second one to get the land was BMC for especially the municipal corporation for hospitals and parks and all sorts of activities that municipal corporation can carry out. And the third one obviously was the mill owners who could get the little one third of the land share and could develop. Uh, there was 
However, there was a small loophole in the in this provision that only if 10% of the total land was developed, then the mill owners could get away with giving this land share to either for low cost housing or to the PMC. Not surprisingly, almost all the mill owners who carried out such development managed to get this exemption and no one had to give this land. Of course, there were many irregularities that were conducted using this particular laws and there were different kinds of posh entertainment places that were built uh, under the name of uh, workers entertainment and therefore uh, this particular uh, regulation called development control regulations was reconsidered in 2001. However, it, as it happened, the mill, worker, mill owners got even further more permission to not only sell the land but also it could be used for non-industrial purposes. The entire mill land could be sold which actually paved the way for the total closure of textile mills in Mumbai. So this is particularly an important uh, provision that the state did, especially the, the Development Control Regulations 2001, because that ensured really the fast closure of textile mills in Mumbai. Uh, but at the same time, given the political nature of the textile workforce in Mumbai, and they knew that such a uh, large amount of workers would be retrenched, uh, they, they made a provision uh, for alternative housing and employment, sorry, alternative employment and housing. And it is this provision of alternative employment and housing in the development control regulations that has led to the political mobilization of the ex-mill workers since 2006. It took a bit while from 2001 to 6 because there were court cases going on over the land issue. However, as noted earlier, the state has made deliberate attempts to move the manufacturing jobs in the hinterland um, far away from the textile district. Besides, it promoted the development of IT services, banks and entertainments. There was also a provision of providing new skills to the retrenched workforce as well as employment. However, as, uh, as I have uh, noted in my thesis elsewhere, that none of the mill owners actually really complied with these particular provisions and only the state uh, owned the National Textile Corporation, only those employees were eligible for uh, the reskilling of uh, so that they could really be incorporated into the new economy. Uh, the proportion is actually very less who have gone for reskilling and also reskilling initiatives by the state came in very late. It came in about 2006. So even if we take uh, the date of closure as 2002 or 4, it came quite late as workers could not really afford to wait for so long to get new skills and then to try out them in the market. And also in terms of alternative employment, um, the, the, private, the mill owners have been uh, quite reluctant in providing employment to the ex-mill workers because the provision said that the ex-mill workers should get alternative employment on the mill lines. And because of this provision, uh, more workers have been bargaining, even today they keep bargaining for this alternative employment. However, as I said, the mill owners have been quite reluctant to give this employment on the mill lines or anywhere else. And so there was this particular committee that was appointed by the state, which is known as Monitoring Committee, to look after the sale and redevelopment of the textile mill lands, also looking into the issue of uh, alternative employment and reskilling of the ex mill workers. And it is in this particular committee that the ex mill workers started mobilizing uh, in large numbers and started demanding that, uh, de uh, that they should get alternative employment as well as on the housing question. And it is at one of the, uh, these uh, monitoring committee meetings that the chair of the monitoring committee meeting, who is a former judge, high court judge, he gave started giving strong directions, of course, based on the amendments which state did, because the state realized that the mill workers have reorganized again, and then the state needs to do something, and therefore they introduced new uh, amendments to the laws and made sure that at least this has been heard. As a result of this, it uh, it did happen that uh, the uh, that uh, mill owners had to really submit what kind of jobs they were available. But even in that cases, the the mill owners really found really different ways of avoiding this employment questions. Particularly, they would send different representatives from their mills or the development office 
on every meeting and since the meetings were just conducted once in a month the the issue of employment got just postponed and postponed even when where some mill workers were employed at the end of it you know because when they didn't have choice some mill workers were did employed in uh, the employment opportunities available on the mill land however they would find some different tactics so that the mill workers would themselves leave the jobs and such as and one of the examples that i have given is that they would give them some lowly work or they would ask them to clean the floor something like so under this category of uh, housekeeping uh, it's a really broad category and i'm quite going to examine that later in my uh, for my book but uh, this particular under this category there are lots of occupation and but they would particularly use this because they would know that workers would feel humiliated by doing this question because of course the uh, the work of cleaning is more mostly associated with dalits and therefore they would actually employers would use caste as a way to get away with the workers mm -hmm. now coming to the question of housing although the, there has been this particular uh, uh, provision as i said in the 2001 development control Re regulation uh, there was a minor modification that was done in that law once on the rule of sharing the land and the minor modification was uh, the question of open space after the demolition so whether the, the the shared land would be on the open spaces after the whole structure of the textile industry is demolished or should be considered only of the open spaces of the mill mill land of course once uh, so the initially the high court in 2005 gave a judgment in favor of the on the mill workers and also in the favor of the environmentalists because it was a big group of uh, uh, people who actually filed the case and they it ruled in favor of mill workers saying uh, a that first of all this land was particularly uh, the redevelopment of land was uh, mainly done to revive the textile industry and since that has not been done that uh, the land share should be after the de demolition of the mill or demolition of all the physical structures in the mill. Obviously that the, uh, all the mill owners went to the Supreme Court where they hired the really the high-flying battery of lawyers and then the judgment turned in favor of the mill owners. Also the state was, it was connivance of the state and the mill owners because the state, uh, re, the state lawyer also said that this particular provision was done so that the development could be done faster. So it was deliberate policy on the part of the state to give larger share to the mill owners. Uh, and as a result, uh, the really the proportion of land uh, has really reduced uh, from really 30% like to really 10% or 5%. It's really, and in some mills, because the open spaces are into the small lanes and by lanes, it has only reduced to 1% of the total proportion. So basically nothing uh, can be done on those particular land. And as a result, uh, the uh, it has of course become a political, uh, it has led to a political mobilization and not just in the city, but also in the different villages, particularly in Western Maharashtra and Konkan, where mill workers have gone back uh, after the closure. And this has gained momentum, particularly after uh, 2000, particularly during 2009, while I was there. And this was also the time where two major elections were taking place in the country. Uh, on the state level, it was the Maharashtra State Assembly elections, and at the national level, it was the general elections, and they took place within a gap of few months. And that is the time actually the political mobilization was really at its peak. Uh, also because once mill workers were organized, all political parties wanted to really address uh, this constituency because they were worried that they might really lose uh, this particular votes. Uh, the state was obviously very careful in handling this particular issue and that's why at various inter intervals uh, it has given some kind of tokenism so that uh, the, the mill workers you know are not really creating anti-state feeling in that way and what so there are some uh, kind of if we, we may call benefits that have the mill workers mobilization has managed to gain the one of the uh, i mean one of the provisions that they could implement is the uh, yellow rationing card which is meant for the meant for people below poverty line so this one the mill workers have managed to get from the state 
the second thing they have managed to get is a separate uh, employment exchange for their children so that uh, whatever job opportunities are available on the mainland their children could benefit from those opportunities and there have been move again to look at the health insurance if that can be revived and those benefits can be given to them and the state also issued the form for housing interestingly in uh, i think in two th i think in late 2011 they issued the form for housing for the exmil workers and the fact that then once the state itself issued this form for housing it gave legitimacy to the mobilization of exmil workers and then uh, it gives even more further confidence to the exmil workers that yeah you know we have a legitimate demand the state is also recognizing that demand and therefore uh, the fact that it can this demand can be actualized was getting this feeling was getting even more firmer and what i have tried to do uh, using my own survey data is to look at the elect, uh, voting behavior of the ex mill workers uh, because historically at least in the textile district uh, that has really uh, been influential uh, the textile workforce uh, but however the given the current situation whereby they have really uh, dispersed to different parts of Mumbai how do we understand uh, this particular voting behavior and what I found in the voting behavior is that the mill workers have voting pattern is more or less similar with the statewide voting pattern based on more or less on caste and religion and maybe on class as well and so that in, in at the first it was puzzling to me that you know at one level there, there is this mobilization going on at its really peak during elections and what happens to this fragmentation of the voting pattern uh, so initially of course it was puzzling to me because the notion of you know organized working class was pretty much there but then i thought through about these results and I realized that there are a couple of reasons. So the first reason is uh, that A, the mill workers obviously are scattered, like are dispersed to different locations. Uh, the B, uh, those who are organizing the mill workers are not present in the electoral arena. They don't really contest elections. And where one or two places where they did try to contest, they didn't have success. Uh, or wherever they tried to mobilize, it was quite a minor faction and therefore mill workers didn't see them as an alternative choice. And, and also there were local level some issues because mill workers have to go to the local representative at the end of the day even though they were organizing as workers. So they have to also keep those neighborhood level considerations into mind while voting. And also the fact that all the political parties extended their support saying that yes these demands are valid, they did not see any reason not to vote for those particular party. And in fact, I have argued that it is this particular fragmentation of uh, voting uh, into different political parties is something that has kept the rehabilitation question at the center stage, given that everyone is giving uh, valid recognition to it. And some concluding remarks. So the first one which is that the state and mill owners relations which have historically been quite cordial have become even more closer and the state and the developers and the mill owners are conniving even more uh, in a close way in the neoliberal era. A democratic politics forces the state to intervene for the ex-mill workers, make some provisions. However, the state connivance with the mill owners and developers means that these provisions remain only at the level of stipulation. In electoral politics, as mill workers remain fragmented, I just, as I just said, it makes even them more valuable for all the political parties who cannot really afford to ignore them. And this is what keeps the mill workers at the center stage. Thank you.